I wasn't going to clear the podium, but good to know that it's all good. Well, thank you for having us. I'm Hallie Kramer. As uh, was mentioned, I work at Google as technical program manager. Honored to be speaking with Audrey today on the path to operating on 24-7 carbon-free energy and the role of data in that, which will build on a lot of the topics and themes that we've heard on over the day and excited to, to think about it from Google's perspective and share that with you all. To start, I want to share Google's energy journey and where that began all the way back in 2007 with carbon neutrality and compensating our operational emissions and neutralizing them through carbon offsets. Then later, moving to something a little bit more ambitious, 100% renewable energy in order to reduce our operational emissions. And in 2020, moving towards 24-7 carbon-free energy and announcing our goal to operate on 24-7 carbon-free energy by 2030. There are a couple of things to notice about this figure to illustrate this journey. The path is not linear. We're not always going to be moving potentially in an upward trend or direction, or upward direction, but the trend should be upward. The second thing to notice is that it's getting steeper over time as our ambition grows. It's getting more difficult, and we're pushing ourselves to be more ambitious over time, especially with our, our latest moonshot for 24-7 carbon free energy. And lastly, because of how steep that gets at the end, one thing to call out is we're not going to be able to do this alone. It's going to require a lot of collaboration, a lot of partnership, uh, a lot of solutions across the market and industry to be able to enable us, and not only us, but others to, to reach that peak. And on a personal level, I joined Google in between the announcement of being able to achieve 100% renewable energy and our 24-7 carbon free energy goal uh, about five years ago. And when I joined, I joined as a carbon free energy analyst, which meant, before we even uh, mentioned what our, our 24-7 goal publicly, we wanted to understand what does this data look like internally. And so I showed up, I saw a bunch of Google Sheets of 8760 profiles, and it was my job to move us out of those Google Sheets into something that was a bit more of a, a scalable data infrastructure so we could not only track and measure our progress, but also forecast what does this look like in the future. And data is a really important piece of that to be able to understand where we are at and then also where we want to go. The next thing I wanted to highlight with 24-7 carbon free energy and, and why it's more ambitious and, and why we're moving towards it uh, as a next step after 100% annual renewable energy, which is showcased in this figure, if you look at a profile of data center, it's fairly flat. That's that black line in the figure. And then you look at, let's say, a wind profile. That's the, the green bars in this figure. As is uh, apparent, there are going to be hours where you're along, and there are going to be hours where you have gaps. And in those hours where you have gaps, even though you might be 100% renewable, we can't say our job is done, because we're still relying on fossil fuel in those hours that uh, the, the wind isn't generating. What's great about 24-7 carbon free energy, when we're able to look at this data and look at these insights, it helps expand the need for different types of solutions that can help fill those gaps. So it's no longer only looking at uh, renewable energy, but it's can we diversify our energy supply? So not only wind, but couple that with solar and, and batteries. Can we do so in a way that if we think about this at a system level, we're, we want to be able to improve grid reliability? Can we bring in the demand side and think about how can we utilize our demand also as a tool to support uh, progress towards 24-7 clean energy supply? And all of the, these things come together so that we can have a, a broader set of options and tools that are needed that will help Google meet our own goal, but will also be beneficial to the system. So when we talk about 24-7 carbon free energy and we think about it, it really is thinking about what does the system need and how can Google, as a voluntary buyer, help support the system needs? Another role of data that we utilize at Google is the role of research and technical modeling. There are a couple of reports out of uh, EIA, TU Berlin, and, and Princeton that look at what are the system impacts of 24-7 carbon-free energy. So at Google, we can look at what does it mean for our own portfolio, but if we assume we can get the market to adopt similar procurement strategies, how does that impact system emissions? And what we see is that the system 
will have lower emissions if we target higher levels of hourly matching rather than annual matching. Not only that, the, uh, one of the other really important things is it can reduce the reliance on fossil fuels and early, in, uh, earlier introduce the need for advanced technologies into the market. And as we increase uh, and have more earlier deployment of those advanced technologies, we can drive down the costs further and help prepare the system uh, for a grid with higher penetration renewables and have those types of resources that can help balance those out. What this means in terms of needing a broader solution set for 24-7 carbon-free energy means that we have a variety of different strategies that can help us make progress there. The first is being able to purchase multiple types of renewables in more regions. And for this, again, it's not just how do we have more PPAs or more diverse set of PPAs, but how do we also build solutions that can make it easier for others to adopt similar goals? So two examples I want to call out here. The first is uh, the, what we call the CFE manager model, which is essentially we are able to partner uh, with one energy supplier who can provide us with a portfolio of clean energy resources to hit a certain 24-7 uh, carbon-free target, and that can grow with our load as our load grows over time. And so it's a scalable approach to say, instead of needing to go out and procure every year to match our load growth, if we have this one supplier that sees our, lo sees our load needs and then also uh, sees the, the target we're trying to meet, we then are, are able to leverage that, that type of deal to better meet our goals and have that be a product in the market that is not only available to us, but that others could use as well. The second example I want to call out on this is uh, the Regulatory Assistance Project recently released a report on a clean transition tariff, which is in vertically integrated markets, what is a tariff that we can use that can support goals like 24-7 carbon-free energy, not only as a tool as tracking where we are today, but again, if you have those types of tariffs, it can impact your planning in those markets. And how do you plan and, and grow clean energy in a way that can meet the needs of your consumers? The second thing I want to call out here in terms of a key strategy is employing technologies to improve economics and performance of existing renewables. And I will say within this category, one example is our time-based energy attribute certificates, which we heard a lot about in the, the previous panel. But the reason that that is an important tool for the economics and performance is it provides a clearer, more distinct price signal, or it can, once we establish the, these markets, to tell when and where clean energy is needed most. So uh, it, it really provides um, more incentive and value to those resources that are generating when and where we need them. We also are looking at next generation carbon free energy technologies. Uh, in the past year, we announced a, a collaboration with Advanced Geothermal. And what are we doing in those areas, again, to, to deploy those sooner than maybe they typically would um, to, to help accelerate the deployment over time? Lastly, a key strategy is to remove policy barriers. We've also heard a theme today of the role of policymakers, regulators, to uh, support the energy transition. And in the case of data, one thing that comes to mind as it relates to policy is how can regulators or policymakers better support um, the need for this data? So whether it be, again, examples used earlier today, 45V uh, hydrogen that requires hourly matching or whether it just be opening up competitive energy access in different markets and making it up to the consumer to understand their data and then make a better choice with it. One other aspect of 24-7 that's related to policy is this local aspect and, and why the local part of 24-7 is important. If we think about certain regions, each region has its own regional context we know climate change is a global problem, but we also know we need to act locally. And so we need to consider what are the, the local constraints? What are the local concerns that we need to address to not uh, clean up, uh, or to be able to clean up exactly where we're operating so that we can grow sustainably? If we think about a couple of examples, we have a data center in Singapore. Singapore is incredibly land constrained, uh, which makes it hard to, to deploy clean energy. And so we need to creatively think, well, what are the solutions that could work there? How might we be able to import clean energy or develop other solutions that might not be typical to the, uh, other regions? 
Another example is in PJM. We're seeing a lot of interconnection issues and challenges today. And so what can we do to help remove those barriers in that specific local uh, locality to help advance our objectives and again be able to grow sustainably in that region? We, I, you might have heard the term garbage in, garbage out. What I, I think is, is interesting here when we think about 24-7 carbon-free energy is whenever you switch your approach to something, so if you're switching from 100% RE to 24-7, there are switching costs. There are switching costs even if what you're moving to is easier to do. And what we're asking people to do with 24-7 is actually a lot harder than what we're doing today. One uh, example I'll, I'll use or um, analogy is We'll see how this works. Let me know afterwards. The, if I'm trying to, to lose weight, I can go on a quick juice cleanse. I can take a week and only drink juice and have fast results, instant gratification, great. But it's not going to last. When we think about 24-7, we're thinking about the system and we're thinking long term. So you might not see that instant gratification of that switch, but you're in it for the long haul. And you're trying to say, how do I change my lifestyle? What are all the different things I can change? It's not just food. It's how I'm uh, working out. It's how I'm sleeping, how I'm hydrating. 24-7 is a similar, all-inclusive approach. We can't just think about renewable energy, but we have to think about the systems we're operating on, the transmission network, the demand side flexibility, and bring those all together. But we can't do that if we don't have good data, and we can't make better decisions if we don't have good data. So in order to inform those higher impact decisions, to be able to bring in all those components, we need to make sure that we have easy access to high-quality data. The second point here on enabling industry alignment to maximize global impact, consistency is really important. We heard in the past panel, uh, one of the, the challenges right now with emissionality or marginal emissions accounting is when, when you say a certain impact, what do you mean by that? What are the assumptions you're making? What's going into your model? What emissions factor are you using? How much of that um, is agreed upon? Which terms uh, are agreed upon? And so. As a market, we need transparency and standardization of methodologies and approaches to drive consistency so that when we say something as a corporate, we make a claim, we're all talking about the same thing and we're comparing apples to apples. And lastly, once you open up this data, again, aligned with themes we heard earlier today, it's not just that we want to open up the data, but it's what can you do, what can you build on top of that afterwards? Tooling, modeling, services, all that can we might not even think of today, but that can innovate and accelerate decarbonization once we, we have access to this. There are many use cases that are dependent on better access to customer data, many that have been talked about earlier today as well. 24-7 Carbon for Energy is a next generation procurement uh, goal, but it's also related to these three other use cases as well, which is how do we bring in grid flexibility to be able to understand with near real time or, or operational data, how can we prevent dispatch of dirty power sources or reduce curtailment of clean energy sources. Within carbon accounting, there are sub use cases of maybe it's corporate account, carbon accounting, maybe it's the product emissions carbon accounting, and each has an important role to play in being able to decarbonize different industries and sectors. Uh, one other example from a carbon accounting perspective is you're seeing increased demand for consumers to want to know what is the electricity that's being purchased for their energy supply. So there is a SB 1158 as an example in California, which is going to require energy retailers to provide on an hourly basis the electricity purchases to their customers, provide more transparency and visibility to them that can hold uh, actors more accountable in that space. And decarbonization pathways, understanding the historical data to inform our modeling, inform our planning, identify what we can and need to do to move quicker and accelerate decarbonization. One I don't have on here but was actually flagged to me earlier this week is in New England, there is a movement to establish a data platform. And the rationale behind that and, and why they're coming together on that is to be able to better calculate the energy savings associated with IRA uh, rebates. So emerging use cases all around, but they all depend on the same foundational data layer. I won't go super deep into the challenges we see today because I think Daniel did 
a great job uh, talking about this earlier this morning. But what I will say is I can validate everything that Daniel said in terms of the challenges from seeing it happen firsthand at Google. At Google, we are a very distributed um, company. We have data centers all over the world. We have offices all over the world. So we work with many different utilities, many different registries. And one of the, the main challenges, if we think about even just looking at one individual utility, the process of being able to get our data, it usually starts with an email to find the right contact person, might get bounced around, might start with then a meeting with that, that team to do some need finding on exactly what we're asking for. Then there's maybe some back and forth, again, over email to make sure that we're uh, aligned on what is gonna be shared. Then it's usually a very manual sharing of data. Sometimes it can be a bit more automatic or um, digital, but oftentimes it's manual. And each of those processes looks a little bit different for each utility. So you can imagine if you're doing that at scale across a number of regions, that gets really difficult, really time consuming uh, if you're doing it ad hoc each way. And the same thing on the production side. If you have a number of PPAs or contracts signed and you need to get your data from each one and there's no standard, then you really have to meet that counterparty where they're at and that can lead to the need for ad hoc one-off building of solutions in each case, which again, takes more time, is more costly. So the value of standardization in this case is really important. And same story on the registry side. If the registries don't have an easy way to be able to extract the data, if uh, it's difficult to authorize a third party to be able to go in and, and get our data and then to be able to aggregate it, standardize the format, uh, standardization of that on the registry side could make it a lot easier to support that type of registry or registry system that Carl had uh, alluded to earlier as well. One last thing I'll say here is uh, we are looking at the, the power of potentially changing and updating contract terms as part of a strategy to ask for data in a certain way of our partners, but early stages and, and we'll see how that happens, but how do we make these contracts more hourly ready and hourly friendly to support our needs? Here is a graphic that is actually part of a one-pager that we share when doing some outreach for the carbon data specification that Daniel talked about earlier. With the carbon data specification, what are we aiming to achieve? What do we mean when we say we want access, better access to better data? And so these are elements of what we're aiming to achieve and what we would want to see and measure success against. So is it scalable? Are we getting the right granularity and resolution on a spatial and temporal level? Are there data validation practices to ensure that the processes and the quality of the data is up to par? Is it secure? Privacy security is a, a big concern as well. Is it standardized and can we get it in a timely manner? I'll end this section before I hand it off to Audrey just to say that if there's one thing that I hope comes through as part of this, it's that better data can really be the foundational building block to develop a number of solutions that are needed for any clean energy future. And so it's a win-win-win <laughs> across the board. And uh, here is also a QR code to a paper that Google released earlier this week on data access and the role of energy industry decision makers in supporting how we can uh, better open up and provide access to consumers for this data. With that, I will hand it to Audrey. Thank you. Uh, I'll just cut to the chase. I agree with everything that Hallie said. <laughs> uh, but you know, I can share a little bit about what Microsoft's working on and hopefully provide uh, some examples. Uh, I think I wrote my first, when I was at the California Public Utilities Commission, I wrote a paper. It was called, it was actually called Energy Data Center, not a data center, but an, a center for energy data uh, back in 2013, I think, where we we're looking at like there's all this data, there's all this smart meter data. California is one of the first um, states to roll out smart meters and how can we better utilize this data. So been working on this topic for a long time and I too have filled out paper forms with wet signatures and faxed them to the utility to get data. So I think we, ha we have progressed a bit. Um, so just to give an overview of 
uh, where Microsoft is. Uh, so in July 2021st, we announced our 24-7 matching um, commitment, which we call 100 100 zero, um, by 2030. But along the way, in 2012, we committed to be carbon neutral. We, had a, we have a 100% renewable by 2025 goal, and that's an annual global goal, um, as opposed to an hourly matching and regional goal. Um, and then we also have a commitment to be carbon negative across scope one, two, and three emissions. So all downstream and upstream emissions uh, are included in that um, for our carbon negative goal and to eliminate diesel in our um, diesel backup generators in our data centers. And then we have a goal by 2050 to remove all our historical emissions from the founding of the company uh, to 19, from 1975. Uh, so just talk a little bit more about our hourly matching goal, 100, 100, zero. Uh, and I, I like, I like uh, Hallie's uh, analogy of the mountain. Um, it's, it's a commitment for ourselves that by 2030, 100% of our electricity consumption, 100% of the time, will be matched by zero carbon uh, energy purchases. And so we're charting that path along with Google and, and other leaders on this. Um, but really, it doesn't, I mean, in the scheme of things, it doesn't matter if Microsoft checks the box and does this. It's really about the rest of the grid, the rest of the world, the rest of the economy. And so that vision of how on all the world's grids, I think Hallie you know, talked a lot about this, how on all the world's grids that we can get to this 100, 100, zero vision. And actually, uh, I like the mountain analogy because I was watching, I, I flew on, on my way over here, I watched the documentary with um, Ray Anderson and Interface Carpets. I don't know if anyone knows the story about Ray Anderson. Um, but there's a documentary on the United Flight, if you happen to be <laughs> on that. Which, and he talks about that mountain. And, and I like to think that it's not, it's not like a Mount Everest where only experts can climb that mountain. It's a mountain that you know, it was hard to climb at first, but that we can trail a path and others can, everyone can be on that mountain as well. Um, and it's very accessible. And everyone wants to be on that mountain because it's good for business. Because, uh, I mean, first off, it's our social license to operate to be able to make these, make these commitments for our customers, because our emissions are our customer scope three emissions. Um, so it's our social license to operate as a company, but it also is good for, good for business as well. Uh, I think I talked a lot, I mean, just kind of, I talked a little bit about our transition from 100% renewable global annual matching. We've talked a lot about it in some of the other panels as well, and then moving to this time, location, and carbon impact and then really getting to that decarbonized grid. And that is a mixture of policy, of course, technology, data. Hallie, I think, ran through a lot of those, those key points. But we, of course, also are aligned with Google and others, uh, others here on the need for increase in transparency. Um, I think, Hallie, you also talked about local needs. Data, our data centers, where primarily our electricity consumption resides in our data centers, they are physical places. They're not actually in the cloud, and they are in local communities and really understanding not only the global atmosphere and emission, carbon emissions, but also the local communities where they sit and um, the uh, impact of energy consumption on these communities is really important as well, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, and then how can we continue to evolve our approach on data, accounting, and markets like, like we've talked about. So I'll just go through a few examples, and I think these projects really um, underpin um, the need for granular energy data. Um, so we're trying to use these projects as pilots to figure out, well, what is this data? How do we set up these systems? How do we set up these platforms? Work with partners, work with other companies, that are, like in the previous panel, that are developing these tools um, to, get, to get all of this going. So for example, um, we have some new commercial models, one with uh, PowerX, where we're matching our data center demand, hourly data center demand in Washington state with deliveries of carbon-free hydro, solar, and wind on an hourly um, around the clock, around the year um, basis. Uh, and then in Virginia, we're working with AES um, for with, uh, to deliver 576 megawatts of solar, wind, and battery. So to Hallie's point about incorporating other technologies beyond solar and wind. Uh, and then in, with, uh, we have a project with um, Constellation to also have this platform to deliver hourly um, hourly carbon-free energy uh, based, uh, based on our hourly load, um, and then also including nuclear into that in our true up. Uh, and then in terms of market transformation, we do have a, a PPA with uh, Helion for fusion, fusion power. Um, it's scheduled for deployment in 2028. We'll see how that, <laughs> how that happens. Uh, I'm, hopefully it, it does. Uh, level 10 energy, um, of course, um, with Katie's, Katie's company. Uh, with uh, Google and AES and Constellation also as founding members. Um, and then the more recently announced Advanced Technology Consortium where as buyers we can pool together our demand uh, and hopefully um, you leverage our buyer resources to then bring on more advanced technologies um, that are uh, 
uh, in order to bring them online sooner um, and try to speed up that technology, uh, technology deployment. And then I just have a couple examples. One was one of our earliest ones for 24-7 uh, renewable matching with Vattenfall in Sweden. Uh, and so we were, Vattenfall was able to leverage our Azure cloud platform um, to match renewable energy to hourly. And, you can, and, and in this particular grid, it's mostly wind and hydro. Um, so this is for a data center and office, uh, um, our offices in Sweden. Um, and, and really, Microsoft, we're trying to think about what is our role as a corporate in this larger ecosystem of different stakeholders, right? There's, there's policy, there's technology, there's, there's software, there's open source. Um, so we, we are a developer of tools as a software company. We can be an early adopter of services. Um, and then we can also use our, our voice to advocate for better data, as, as Google is doing as well. Um, and then over time, we've incorporated energy tag, granular certificate standards, um, and better carbon stamping to understand the emissions impact. And then one more example is our 24-7 um, pilot with the, uh, the Netherlands with um, FlexiDAO. And so this is a three-month 24-7 hourly matching uh, pilot um, with our uh, existing supply agreement with Ineco. Uh, and so this was an opportunity for us to try this out and then give our feedback on, um, on the issu issuance of, uh, sorry, G GOs are, uh, <laughs> Guarantees of origin, thank you. <laughs> Guarantees of origin. I have all these acronyms swimming in my head. Um, and then, uh, so ability to test, and then in this particular case, using Dutch testing with Dutch win. And every grid is slightly different in the mid-grid mix, and so it's great to be able to, to, to try these out um, and then provide feedback with, uh, with CertiQ on the um, Guarantees of origin uh, methodology and provide, provide recommendations. Um, so hopefully we can scale this in Netherlands after, after this pilot as well. And then, do you want to? Okay. Um, so I, I mean, I first got involved with Linux Foundation Energy actually when Shuli, the previous executive director, started. Um, and to me, it's it just it makes sense in the energy industry. And I'm you know looking for any ways that we can accelerate the clean energy transition. Um, so I think open source just makes a lot of sense to me, allowing us to collaborate. Um, it's it's all of our electricity grid. It's all of our atmosphere. Um, and how do we support that digitalization? How do we support utilities and grid operators in that transition? Uh, and I, you know, I'm not, I'm not a veteran in the open source software community. I'm kind of an observer from the sides, that's wanting to learn, eager to learn more. Um, but I just have a lot of confidence um, that this model can hopefully apply. I think it's, it is a, it is a long road because it is not an industry that is steeped in the open source culture. Um, but I think uh, I'm very excited to see all of you and all the presentations and what we can do to kind of change the energy industry culture um, to allow this model to, to thrive. Um, so I wanted to double click a bit more into a couple of the examples that Audrey mentioned as well. So the first being the Granular Certificate Trading Alliance. This is something that was led by Level 10 in collaboration with Microsoft, uh, Google, AES, and Constellation. And there's a, uh, the, the purpose of this alliance is to build a marketplace for time and location-based EAC procurement. It's a management platform of that so that you would be able to trade and match to fill the gaps where you are short and then be able to liquidate excess where you are long. And the hope and the theory of change there is if you're able to develop this market, develop liquidity in this market, you can then create those transparent price signals I was talking about earlier that can tell us, oh, we have enough solar on the grid right now. Uh, these, these EACs might not be worth as much, but what we really need is in these ramping hours a firm dispatchable technology that we're willing to value at X price to help, uh, to help with the, the deployment of that. So this type of alliance and this type of building of a marketplace is really meant to provide that transparency and market signals to the clean energy that is needed on a local and hourly basis. And it couldn't be done alone, so we need to all work together and we're still actively looking for supporters if, if there are companies here that are interested in, in uh, signing on to the principles and the need for this kind of development in the marketplace. And the second example to dive into a little bit more is this demand aggregation model that Audrey mentioned between Google, Microsoft, and Nucor, which uh, the, the benefits of this is really to bring one, have a, a demand signal in the future for what is uh, desired by customers and bring that unified 
electricity customer voice to signal that demand. The second is creating that business and project delivery model that can bring these advanced tech online faster. And then also being able to mitigate the development risks of any one specific project or technology by bundling it together, both on the, the demand side and then on looking at the supply as well, so that we can bring, it, uh, bring ourselves down on that commercialization, commercialization curve um, to, to advance these technologies that we know we'll need in every uh, modeling scenario that we've seen. These advanced technologies will play a cu crucial role for that last mile on the, the grid. With that, Time for questions. How can, how can we, I mean, how, how can we help as corporates? Like, give us direction. What more can we do <laughs> from where we sit? Take a first crack. Yeah, um, so I don't know if you remember in the previous panel, there were the different accounting methods. And I think what we're talking about here is the market-based accounting methods. So like, for example, with the advanced market commitment, that is buying uh, electric EAC, electri uh, <laughs> environmental <laughs> attribution <Yeah. credit laughs> certificates. Uh, so it's an accounting method as opposed to a physical procurement that physical procurement of electricity goes directly to the data center. And the idea is that if we are procuring uh, additional zero carbon resources, we are helping decarbonize the entire grid, which will then eventually get us to a decarbonized grid, and then our data centers on those grids will be on zero carbon energy. Now, it would be good also to work on the other side, you know, work at it from both directions, doing that, and then working with utilities, um, working with regulators to figure out, well, how can, how, where we have influence as a large customer for data centers, um, how can we influence those integrated resource plans from utilities? Um, you might have seen Microsoft filed some comments with the uh, state of Georgia. You know, how do we influence those IRPs with utilities in order for them to, in their planning, to green the grid as well? Um, for Microsoft data centers, uh, I mentioned the diesel-free commitment by 2030, which will be a big challenge for us. We do have diesel backup generators um, at our data centers to provide that five nines reliability. We are looking for other, so this is on-site generation now for backup when there is a grid outage. We are looking for new technologies that we can implement. So for example, we have natural gas generators um, in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and we're planning to do that in um, San Jose in California with Enchanted Rock, and we'll be procuring renewable natural gas for that, which has a much lower carbon intensity and negative carbon intensity um, compared to natural gas. Uh, in order to replace those diesel backup generators. And we're also looking at batteries, we're looking at just more, better, tr uh, more transmission connections so that we don't need to have those backup. Um, so those are some ways that we're trying to meet the resiliency but try to also decarbonize. I'll just add uh, quickly, plus one to everything Audrey said, we're still plugged into the grid, still, still using, pulling electricity directly from the grid. But the, the theory of change on this is CNI customers are a large batch of customers, and if everyone is doing this in a given region and location, and we bring in those elements of this is locationally matched and it's hourly matched, we're moving that market-based accounting more to towards the physical reality, such that when it then happens at scale, we're able to, to drive that change that we want to see on the broader grid as well. And I'll, and I'll just add, like, the reason for going beyond wind and solar and looking at technologies like you mentioned, geothermal, looking at nuclear, other zero carbon base load technologies also, or batteries as well, is to provide that reliability for the grid. Like, we don't, we don't want our procurement to be disjointed from way, the way the grid actually works. The grid actually has to match supply and demand at the same time, you know, every second. Um, and so we want our procurement to reflect how does the grid actually get to that decarbonization uh, end point. Yeah, I can go first. Uh, so 
In terms of the, the market-based accounting we see today, there, because it's an inventory-based accounting, there technically isn't additionality criteria, but because at Google we want to make sure what we're doing has impact, we have our own internal guardrails, and uh, I will say additionality is a spectrum. There's no clear cut this is or isn't, or, or a clean external test that we've seen. If you have one, let us know, please. Uh, but it is something we strive for, and the, the indicators that we look at to strive for it is what impact is what we're doing having in reality in the market. And so whether that be a long-term PPA, where we know that by signing this, we're able to, to get that project financed and move it forward, um, or whether it be some other model that, again, helps get a project financed or helps accelerate the development of certain projects helps provide impact into a system to let you know which projects or are more valuable. There are a lot of different ways that I think you could look at or measure additionality, and, and it's always going to be a work in progress, and we're just striving to, to move up that curve and make sure what we're doing has impacts. Yeah, for, for our 100-100-0 goal, I mean, there's a piece that is the existing grid mix, so if, our, um, if in a certain region our load is on a certain grid and that grid has a certain percentage of zero carbon resources, we'll count that. And then whatever additional then that needs to get us to 100% of the time, um, then, uh, then that procurement will be, will be additional. So it's a, it's a careful, and I think our methodology is slightly different, but it's a, careful it's a careful accounting of like what can we actually lay claim to that is because of our investment and we're not laying claim to investments in zero carbon resources that others have made or ratepayers have made, like we're not trying to claim those uh, in our accounting. Um, but I, you know, I think with, with the scope two GHG protocol revision, I think that will hopefully bring more clarity for everyone in terms of what is, you know, what is the methodology that we all adhere to. Uh, no, def definitely different approach. I think, so to repeat the question, is it different approaches for vertically integrated markets versus more competitive deregulated markets, right? Um, and, and absolutely, I think we, we have to. Um, and so for vertically integrated par uh, markets, like how do we partner with a vertically integrated utility to get to a, a more decarbonized grid? And that can be technology collaboration, like how do we help them? But I think you mentioned the um, tariffs from the clean tariff from the regulatory assistance yep. project. I'm guessing what that is, but it sounds like <laughs> something exactly. that you can do yeah. in vertically integrated yep. um, where, you know, we can pay a, we can, if I understand it correctly, we can pay a premium for new technology. I think this has been done with green tariffs with solar yeah, so and wind, but then why not open that up to Newton's other zero carbon technologies as well, and we'd be willing to pay a premium for that in order to integrate more of that, and that would be additional uh, also, but run through the utility through through a tariff. Um, and then in, in competitive markets, you know, it can, be, it can be easier. Of course, there are challenges with interconnection as well. And, and I would love, love input on what we can do about, what we as a corporate can do about that. I mean, one example in terms of getting more renewables projects online is our investment in the Qcell solar panel factory in, in Georgia, right? We saw supply chain, issue, supply chain issues, and so what can we do? Can we help invest in more domestic uh, PV manufacturing um, to help our, you know, our solar developer partners deploy solar more quickly? Our time is up, but there were a couple more questions. If you all want to find us afterwards, we will be around. Thank you. Thank you.